Welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. On the program this week, I'll be speaking with Nigeria's Minister of Works and Housing, Baba Tunde Raje Fashola SAN. But before the big talk with the former governor of Lagos State, my column will be read to you now. I have decided to follow Jesus. It I is Ramon decided. Abbas he bears. Even that name puzzles. Some reports anglicize his first name as Raymond, but it is Hush Puppy we know. Poetic, lyrical, and even symbolic. Hush implies silent, furtive, conspiratorial, shadowy. Puppy in this regard means playful, like a weak old dog. That makes him a sly dog. But then it has other origin stories, some others dated back to the founding of New Orleans that gives the world Mardi Gras, an unhinged carnival for pilgrims of pleasure. An immigrant woman invented a snack of a ball out of cornmeal, and the city called it Hush Puppy, their own incarnation of Akara. Even then, Abbas's nickname is spelled ending with an I instead of a Y. The one picture that has trended of late features him in a shirt sporting a familiar brand, Fendi. But another brand had been stalking him like a forest cat, slinking, long-suffering, and calculating. It was a brand as counterforce, FBI, nabbed in Dubai but caught in the United States. The sojourn of a colorful conman comes to an end. Behind bars, he will wear neither Gucci nor Louis Vuitton, but an orange top that will at best say Inmit. Now he is no more hush puppy. He is now Abbas. He buried his real name in a casket of lies and deceit. He was reborn a glamour icon, one named abandoned home and become a global smart aleck. He was a man of means with no means of livelihood. He conquered cyberspace, dispossessed the gullible, stashed his global bank account, strutted the world, amassed dream cars, snored in palaces, dressed like a fop, preened like a peacock, seduced the young and befuddled the old. He became a role model to a lazy generation that lapped luxury without labor. When he was caught, the FBI buried Hush Puppy and rebirthed Abbas. But where is the real Abbas, though? Can he recognize Ramon again? He cannot. Like Sophocles, Antigone, he neither dwells among men nor ghosts. But Abbas is a tale for the moment, if in reverse. He was caught trying to denude a group of people in millions of dollars and palliatives in a time of pandemic. Abbas is a picture of avarice at a time of sacrifice. He was flaunting his shoes, cars, mansion, parties, at a time when many hid behind homes, suffered in hospitals, coughed in misery, mourned or were mourned. He represented a heartless species when we were supposed to be our neighbor's keepers, when many were suddenly whisked, whisked out of work, when his fellow country folks lost their jobs and men of means contributed their millions and billions to the poor. Abbas was a show-off. The thing with Abbas was no lockdown could stop his party. His extravagance was online. The world was his audience. He had come to represent a generation of Nigerians who did not trust their parents or their bosses or their leaders. They followed their greed. They followed Hush Puppy. He was a priest of a new goddess, money. Abbas for them was a sort of escape. He had become the man who gamed the system and scored. All the stadia in the world applauded. Abbas epitomizes the Yahoo boys, and in his fall is their fall. It is a commupence for a tribe of desperados who have demonized technological genius. The new frontier of progress is also their front for fraud. It is not for nothing that he has been associated with some of our big-name politicians, even if they had nothing in common. He has had photo ops with a few of them. If he were not Hosh Puppy, 
but merely Ramon Abbas. If he were not hush puppy, but merely Ramon Abbas, we might not have seen such pictures. But our politicians have one quality in common with him, impunity. When leaders promise and turn back on their word, it is as bad a lie as a hush puppy popping up on a person's email and asking for one piece of information and turning the email into an opportunity to stalk and destroy. We also see our politicians take away our money when others have nothing. Fraud is now familiar terrain for politicians. To be a politician is to seek avenue for self-service, not service to all. But the arrest of Abbas is hope, but not enough. It shows even the new frontier can be stalked and the crime encircled and ended. Our people are not doing well enough to catch those who are well off by wrong means. A few have been caught. We want more. Abbas is caught today and no one is hailing him. His audience is now jeering. He is like Jay Gatsby in Scott Fitzgerald's novel. He acquires his fable of wealth to get back a woman and buys a big mansion, just like Hush Puppy. Every neighbor comes to his frequent parties, but not the woman he craves. He eventually dies alone and poor. Everybody comes to his parties, but no one goes to his funeral. Abbas is alone now. So is Hush Puppy. Hush Puppy's frozen eyes look without seeing as Abbas goes behind bars. In terms of uh, innovations, uh, you know, the Highway Development and Management in Initiative, which you presented to the National Assembly and, uh, uh, and stake, uh, stakeholders through Webina, um, what, what uh, do you think Nigerians could learn from that? Well, Nigerians, the first thing I, I'd like to share there is that we can organize ourselves better and use our existing assets even better um, to, to experience a better journey and travel experience in our country. So some of the things that come into the Highway Development Management Initiative is we need to clean the highways, for example. There are people whose businesses are waste managers. We need to... Uh, provide rest houses for tired drivers. There are people who trade in hotel management. So if you build rest houses and work with the best hotel managers, there are food vendors as well who will provide that support. Within that rest house, there are people whose business is to sell fuel. So you can partner with any fuel downstream operator as your partner. You can partner with any uh, auto repair shop. There are people whose work that is then even the auto repair shop, we need a vulcanizer, somebody who sells, who retails spare parts. So it's to bring together an entire ecosystem. The people in advertising, so we see billboards, we want to standardize, make these things look good, make them profitable, and also bring governance and maintenance. So there are construction companies that can form part of a consortium to then ensure that a road is repaired more regularly than perhaps it, it, it was in the past. There will be, unfortunately, accidents from time to time. So anybody who wins the concession may partner with a health service company to provide ambulance and recovery services. So we need, what we then need is for small, small businesses to come together to form a big joint venture, a concession, and then bid for this road asset. So you can bid for 100 kilometers of the road and manage it much more efficiently. It also helps us then uh, be able to focus more on who is doing what because we will have a contract with one person who has partnered with others. So ultimately, it should be a win-win for the entire entire. Um, the, the second Niger Bridge is still uh, under, under uh, construction and it's on the, under a different fund, I remember. Is it the infrastructure fund? Uh, yeah, it's under the PIBF that I yes. told you about. Yes, yeah, you told me about. Now, is it in any way affected by pandemic, the operation and the speed oh, of it? Oh, oh. oh, yes, it is. Every, everything is affected one way or the other. Um, one of the things 
that we first experienced was that our contractors had to stop work when the first nationwide lockdown was declared by Mr. President. So it was in the first phase of the easing of the lockdown that we were able to remobilize contractors back to work. And that is the part that I had spoken to earlier, that the big 11 construction companies yeah. who are executing 53 projects in 26 states have returned to work. So the second Niger Bridge is one of those projects. The Lagos Ibadra is one of those projects. Abuja Kano is one of those projects. Um, um, local Weto is one of those projects. Uh, Kano Maiduguri is one of those projects. Bini to Lokoja is one of those projects where our contractors are now working in collaboration with the state governors who are the incident managers in their states because there has to be cross-border movement. And this is important because in some states, you don't have all the building materials, you have to cross border. For example, in Lagos, most of the laterite and the cross stones and all the granite that is used in construction comes from Okun. So if you don't have that interstate collaboration, you won't get uh, materials. Same thing, uh, Cross River State provides most of the supply for the south, south, and parts of the southeast, and, and so on, like that. So at the hurdles we had to cross. We also had to issue new health guidelines on construction sites because of the NCDC guidelines about face masks, social distancing, and hand sanitation. So number of workers have to be reduced in some cases, uh, and so on and so forth. How to clean surfaces because people have to work for an approved period as, as, as approved by the International Labor Organization guidelines. So when they are changing shift, how to clean the cabin of a caterpillar, a truck, a crane, and all of that for the next person so that it is safe. How the workers are now going to feed themselves because they can't share utensils anymore. So these are new guidelines that our ministry has issued now to the companies that have resumed work and uh, how to social distance and still work together uh, our new guidelines. We are also hoping that uh, very soon, when the interstate movement is lifted, we want FEMA to return to do maintenance and repair works, as distinct from construction that I've been talking about, maintenance and repair works in 92 locations across 24 states. So that will come again, and that will help again provide work, lift the economy, drive demand for construction equipment, construction materials, and so on and so forth. So all of these are also part of that economic sustainability plan uh, that we had talked about. Kubin, but then there's, there's this question I need to ask. Have you had reports of positives uh, to COVID-19 testing among workers and even fatalities? I have not heard yet, but you know these stories don't. At this get moment, at this at this moment, no. And I touch wood for that. It means that we are doing some things right so far, and uh, we intend to keep it like that. Do you? As I said, we issued revised health guidelines. Do you make any? Have you made any conscious effort to to inquire whether there have been cases which are which probably were not brought to your notice? No, what we, what we get is a weekly report. As against, we used to get monthly reports on all our projects. We are now getting weekly reports because we are obliged to report everything that is going on during the ease of the lockdown because it is part of the information that goes back to the NCDC as a way of briefing the president about what next to do. So at this moment, the answer is we don't have any reported incidents at our construction site yet. Now, going and to... And we hope not to. Yeah, I hope so. Going to housing, when you were governor, one of the, the, the ideas that you really wanted to push was the fact that housing was not just about accommodation, but also about culture, about building the economy, about uh, creating centers of commerce and activity, other than just... Um, just um you know a place where you go and lay your head 
now looking at it nationwide and because of the, the varieties of topography and also of culture, how have you been able to bring this kind of idea to bear in a, in a housing project uh, under your watch? Well, I think the, 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 the first point to make here is that uh, we cannot fully appreciate the impact of the government on housing if we focus only on what the federal government is doing. And this is important. And I would implore you to see how many more private housing initiatives are springing up more regularly now under the Buhari administration than they were a decade ago. Something has changed, and it is for the positive. So the national housing story cannot be told without including the report and the story of the private sector. That is one. The second point to make, and so I am happy to be minister at a time when there is increasing investment appetite by the private sector in developing housing for different strata of the society. It means that our policies have worked. It means that we have provided the enabling environment, which is the biggest tool that we can deliver to enable private sector to then play the role. The American Federation, the federal government doesn't build houses. And this is what we are also trying to achieve. So the national housing project we are developing is just to set, uh, for want of a better word, a benchmark on house types. Because we know that we cannot build enough to accommodate everybody's need. And this speaks to the point you made about culture and all of that, because the way people build in the north and the type of land that is available up north is different from the way they build down south. And those are the cultural differences that we have established. Bungalows, more bungalows for the north, more blocks of flats for the south. And we've established that. And we are now moving to cooperative housing, where we're encouraging small clusters of people, journalists cooperative, nurses cooperative, uh, bus drivers cooperative, market women, farmers cooperative, go and register yourself, uh, get your own land, design your own building, take approval from your state government that that building conforms to the state's developmental plan and we will give you a developmental loan up to 80% of the cost from any of our federal mortgage banks in the 36 states and FCT, if you open an account under the National Housing Fund. That is the financial and fiscal muscle we bring to bear now in the field. And we are issuing mortgages, we are uh, issuing home renovation loans to contributors to the National Housing Fund. And that, those numbers are growing. Um, we are also issuing uh, title documents. So we are playing a lot in housing. And that is adding value to people's property. So when President Buhari says, I'm going to lift 100 million people out of poverty, if you get a title document, the land is much more valuable than a land that has no title. And the infrastructure we are building adds up to 40% in capital value to the price of any land abutting any of the roads we're building nationwide. So this is the prosperity that we are bringing to bear. Apart from the immediate benefit from the construction. So all our housing sites also are job centers, masons, food vendors, artisans, skilled, non-skilled suppliers. So all of that is how happening. And I, I am delighted to, to be the head of the ministry at this time that we're doing so much across the states. But it's a time too that uh, the population is uh, burgeoning and the appetite for housing is uh, also rising and it's, 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 it's also a tension to try to do that. Yes, it is. Well, if you do population burgeoning, some people are also exiting. Sadly, we've lost a few colleagues. Condolences once again to the Ajimobi family who we lost in the, in the in few days. So people have gone. So 
uh, and people, more people are, some people are also arriving. So we need a census to really know how many we are. But where the demand for housing is, in my view, based on what I've seen, based on what I've observed, undebatably, it's in the urban centers. It's, it's an urban problem. Yeah. So in the rural areas, uh, the demand is not for housing is not as prolific as in the urban centers. And even in the urban centers where we have that demand, uh, what you don't see also is that there are empty houses. And perhaps COVID provides an enormous opportunity to put all those empty houses back into occupation. So instead of asking for two years rent now, maybe landlords might begin to think about, okay, let me take one month's rent in, in areas every month. Maybe somebody will afford it. So that might help to change some things. And people who then are relieved of the burden of, uh, of uh, paying two years rent can transfer that benefit because it becomes a benefit to their own employees. So perhaps this is also the time for tenants to say, look, landlord, why should we be paying this uh, two years rent in advance? My salary doesn't come two years in advance. And I'm even struggling to keep my job now. But let me offer you 90 days or even every 30 days. I will pay you. Perhaps this is the time when tenants can rebag it. And I am not trying to incite anybody against the other, but perhaps this is just the time to free up some of these things because it accounts partly for a lot of unoccupied houses because people just can't put the money together at once. So in other jurisdictions, people don't pay two years rent in advance. Mm. They pay one month rent or one week's rent yeah. in areas where they get paid. So if we release ourselves from these pressures as a community, and government doesn't own this property, so it's unable to force it down. But I will continue to appeal to people that these are very innovative and welcome developments that can release pressure, create prosperity, a shared prosperity for all of us. If we start with thinking these two years rent in advance, one year rent in advance, and find other ways of securing the continuous payment of rent. So you can ask the landlord, the tenant, to bring you a guarantee from his employee, employer, sorry, that they will deduct his rent every month before they pay and pay it to you. Mm. So if you secure your rent every month, at the end of every month, then why should you ask for two years rent in advance? Mm. Really and truly, because you, the money will come regularly. And the employer becomes bound to let you know when he's laying off that employee and to seek a discharge of the guarantee, as the case may be. But it's not a fully, fully um, examined idea, but it's an idea well, what considering that I'm throwing out into the public space for people to think how to secure the payment of monthly rent. Perhaps, Insurance companies can play a role there. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps also, there's a sense too that even the value of property is out of sync with the economy. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And that is partly explainable by the fact that uh, it is doubtful whether any significant number of the unoccupied properties are tied to our banking system. Because if you were paying interest and principal on a house that you took a loan to build, you will you are less likely to keep it empty. Yes. All right. You are less likely. To, yes. So it's, it's important to make that connection now. Yes. And the economy will be better for it when every investment in real estate or a large part of it is relatable to the banking system. Yes, and that is more of an urban problem, especially the big cities. <laughs> well, it's a good place to start. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, the Minister of Works and Housing, or who I call the Trojan of Works, for being on this uh, show. We could go on uh, discussing a lot more about... Uh, your your work in the in the country thank you very much uh, for being with us thank you these images are a homage to the black lives matter cause and reflect how humans debase their fellow creatures in the name of god law and business 
Just before the program ends, this is my poem in honor of Leah Sharibu. You must not think of legacy, not love, because you have a marriage without it. Not fertility, because you have a son by violating it. Not work, for you do it by force. Not your only child, for it was stolen from nature. Not your man, Ashtaglia, is too mean to mean a home. Thank you for watching the program today. You can catch up with my published column on www.samomashe.com. Also follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Sam Omashe. Until next time, be good.